Hi folks, welcome to another edition of Tinnitus TV. Today my guest is singer-guitarist David Gogo. Now if you live in Canada and you love the blues, I'm pretty sure you already know who David Gogo is. At the very least, you should know who he is, he's been at this long enough. He released his first album back in 1994, after all, and since then he's released about 15 more leading up to his new album, Silver Cup, which is an acoustic affair that he made at his Nanaimo home with his old pal and frequent collaborator Steve Mariner. Now, in between that first album and Silver Cup, Gogo has earned a slew of awards, been nominated for tons more, toured everywhere and rubbed shoulders with a whole host of musical icons and heroes. A few weeks back, he zoomed in from his house and we talked about Silver Cup, collecting mining helmets, his guitars, um, being disqualified for a Juno Award, and plenty more. We had a great chat and I think you'll enjoy it. Here's how it went. So 16 albums into your career. That's a, that's a lot of albums. Does it, does it feel like 16 albums? Uh, you know, in some ways, it, it, not, absolutely not, because I still feel like I'm the same, you know, 21-year-old guy out there on the road doing it and making my first record. Obviously, I'm not. But in some ways, it does, because we, we're starting to finally get to know what, how to do it, you know, and, and what we're good at and, 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 and how to make things better. So, you know, you try to make every record, you know, the latest being the greatest. And uh, that's the way I feel about this one. So it's, I'm lucky like that. Well, I, wanted, I wanted to ask you about that. How do you how do you sort of keep challenging yourself and keep it fresh after, you know, essentially repeating this process over and over for two decades, especially in, in an idiom like blues, which is is kind of a box to begin with, you know? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, try to reinvent something that's, you know, been around for 100 years and um, or longer. And yeah, like the musical parameters, there's only so much that you can get away with without alienating your fans. Um, I, I find that writing songs is the biggest thing and something I, I feel that I've, I've um, improved upon in the last decade or so. So that's a big part of, of keeping the blues alive is, is bringing new songs into um, the spectrum. And with this record, it's mainly like it's, it's an acoustic record. I asked Steve Mariner to come and do it with me. And so, so that was a challenge for me because I'm kind of more known as a, you know, a hotshot guitarist, electric guitarist and, you know, the solos and everything else. So this was just um, done at home on acoustic instruments and a lot of them like a 1930 National Guitar, a 1920 Gibson, things like that. So that that also, you know makes you challenges me as a, as a as an artist as a musician right well i want to get to all of that but let's let's stick on the songwriting there for a minute because you mentioned you know kind of feeling like you're getting better at it i mean are you talking about just the technical aspects of it or are you talking about being able to to tap into your emotions better or transfer what you're hearing in your head onto the tape or you know what Kind of all of the above. And I think that's the, the nice thing about blues music or folk music is as you get on in life, you have more experiences to draw from and a better perspective and outlook on life. And that's that happens on this album a, a bit for sure. And, um, you know, funny little things, as long as you keep um, kind of growing as a musician, like a fellow that I wrote two songs with on this record, Eric Johnson, when we got together, out on the porch socially distanced and everything he had just showed me one one little trick where you get a capo which is a, a clamp that you put on a guitar neck to hold the strings down but it was a little trick he showed me where we, you put it on the second fret but you don't put the clamp over the low e string and it sets up this whole kind of different vibe and i ended up writing a couple songs using that technique so you know it's just that i I didn't count on learning that that day, but I did. And uh, it, it happened to um, factor into a couple of the new songs. And so it's like the equivalent of, of a drop D almost, except you're just taking the other ones up, right? Basically, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, lyrically, uh, what were you uh, tapping into on, on this? You, you talked about some, some of these songs being sort of more personal. And, and, and I, I hear some reflective things in, in some of these songs. Well, the big thing that I didn't want to do was to write about the pandemic. Oh, that's, okay. kind of, that's one thing I decided not to do. I don't want to celebrate this at all. You know, it's, 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 uh, you know it was a real punch in the gut to, for the whole music industry, not just musicians, but, you know, technical people, you know, the promoters, venue owners, venue staff. So, yeah, no lockdown blues, no keep your distance or any of that stuff. 
And honestly, when I first started writing, it was probably like the first April when things really like were locked down. Right. And, and I just thought, I just want to stay creative and I'm just going to write and I'm not going to have any blinders on. I didn't know if I was writing for an album or if I was just writing for maybe someone, another artist or something. So I wasn't writing about anything in particular, but then just things happen in life. Uh, there's one song, the last song in the record, uh, Top Shelf, and that came from just a fellow that I met when I was around 16, a musician, and he used to live on Gabriel Island out here on the West Coast and eventually moved out to Saskatoon. And I just see him every couple of years, either at my show or if I was, you know, playing a festival or something and see him. And uh, I got a Facebook message. I was down at our little family. It's a river spot in Nanaimo River, a nice little swimming hole, but I had an acoustic guitar with me. And got a message from his brothers and telling me that he had the, this, this gentleman, Frank, had had a series of heart attacks and it wasn't looking good. So I sent him a quick message and didn't hear back. And five minutes later, I found out he passed away. Hmm. What the last thing he was saying, he was laying in the hospital and he was mumbling something. They go, what are, you, what are you saying, Frank? What are you saying? And he said, top shelf. And they says, top, what does that mean, top shelf? And he says, when you have my party, only drink the good stuff from the top shelf. And when I read that, I just picked up my guitar and you know kind of wrote the chorus right away um right to self yeah yeah it will absolutely and then i took time with the verses and that's one thing about the, the about the pandemic was i've never ever had this much time at home I've, i'm always like i'm a road dog that's kind of what i have to do to make a living so i really had time to work on these songs and make them you know as, as best as i possibly could and a song like that where the chorus kind of came to me right away i really spent some time with the verses i wanted to make it poignant i love the word poignant uh so that was one of them and then there's you know there's another the, the title tracks about family history and uh, the, my metis background on my mother's side so there was a lots of lots of subject matter and then there's some just some good old blues too yeah well exactly are you uh, are you a prolific writer are you somebody who like gets up and sits and writes every day or are you waiting for the lightning bolt is it is there any sort of commonality to to the way you you create these songs I think I could definitely try harder. Um, I, I think that I, I read that someone like Randy Newman gets up every morning and, you know, it's right. kind of like- Goes out to the shed and sits down for eight hours and- Yeah, 10% yeah, inspiration, 90% perspiration. Um, right. The one thing I have been doing, well, not lately because I don't travel as much, but when I'm on the road, if I see something interesting or I hear someone say an interesting line, get it down on the old iPhone, whether you just write it down in the notes or, or, or sing it. And then kind of at the end of each month, I'll go through that and sift through the, get the, <laughs> sifting the, you know, uh, the good stuff out. And uh, that helps a lot, but I'm, I'm more of a guy that I kind of work better under pressure. Like if there's some kind of a deadline, mm -hmm. but, but th this, this, but during the lockdown, it was the first time where actually it was like just writing. You know, because there's you got to stay creative and, you know, like I'm not out on the road. So I think I had a lot more time to develop ideas this time. And it sounds like you're not necessarily married to your first thought either. You, you're willing to sort of revise and improve and, and you know, go into them and, and rework them as you go. I am now. When mm -hmm. I was younger, I always heard, I think it was Allen Ginsberg said, first thought, best thought. Right. And sometimes that's true. But um, in the last couple of albums, I've really gone back. And I think a big important thing for me is to make demos at home. I've got a primitive thing. It's an old ADAT machine. Like I, I'm, not, I'm not smart enough to use computers or anything. But by me going through and arranging these songs, and, and then I'll go back. And there was a song on my, on my last record called Shake My Head. I, I bet you I tore that song down and built it back up a half dozen times. Mm. You know, and you, it might be things like... Um, you know, saying, you know what, the cho that chorus should actually be the verse or, or you know, or backwards. So my, my, yeah, I think my writing technique has changed. I'm much more willing to go back and, um, and change things up. After all these years, is, is it easier to tell when you've kind of struck gold, you know, when you, when you've, when you've really tapped into something or found, uh, you know, that, that really special song? Sometimes, and sometimes you can be completely wrong. And I think this happens a lot with people is, is the songs that they think are kind of like a throwaway. Right. That's the one that really resonates with people. So yeah. you can't always tell, but there's been a couple of times, especially like I say, the last couple of records where I think, you know, I think that's a pretty damn good song. And, and, um, and you find out that people do respond to it and, and it works. So that's great. 
Uh, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, writing some of these songs, socially distanced on the porch. Uh, was that sort of uh, the way you recorded all this too? Were you, were you and Steve ever in a room together or were you just swapping files back and forth? We, a, a project like this, we had to be together. Mm -hmm. um, so we recorded it, uh, I think, end of June. And he came out from Toronto and stayed at my house for two weeks. And mm -hmm. at this point, we were all, had been vaxxed, vaccinated and... Um, you know, he he kind of just been hanging out in in a, in a little circle of friends, and I've just been up up on my at my place with my son and his girlfriend live at my house. So we were both confident that we were safe. But a, a, an album like this, an acoustic album, has to be it's a very organic thing, mm -hmm. and and we bounced off each other a lot. You know, like um, in terms of the recording, um, a lot of the the takes were, were were done in in the first couple of takes and us playing live you know playing with each other so that was an important part of this record but it's also i mean it's just the two of you essentially aside from a couple of other guest spots so you're you're building these tracks up performance by performance and that's that's got to be kind of tough to do and still sustain that that kind of organic element you know when it's not a, a band in a room playing all at once well, because it's mostly acoustic, like uh, Steve did end up playing drums in a couple things and he added some other parts. I mean, he can play just about any instrument you want. But the kind of the, the nuts and bolts of each song were, were, were just basically um, the two of us together. Sometimes we both play guitar or I just play guitar and he played piano. So the, the core of the songs can be played by two people. And that was my, my the big idea with the song, too, is I realized that this, you know, pandemic, it could go on for a long time still. You never know. Like it's, you know, things could take a turn for the worse and all of a sudden everything's canceled again. And even though things have opened up, it's limited capacity audiences. So I thought, well, I, should, I better make a record that I can either tour on my own or with one other person because it's mm -hmm. going to be very difficult to bring the full band out. If things do open up and I have the band, there's, there's still songs on, on there that we can do with a band, you know, just to kind right. of expand it a bit. But um, yeah, and, and, and it was the cool thing about doing it at my house too was that's one thing Steve did during the lockdown was he really honed his engineering and recording skills. Mm. And I know he's been, he was spent a lot of time, Jimmy Boskill's got a studio in, in Ontario and Steve really was an apt pupil there and learned a lot about mic placement and just getting good sounds. And so it, it was, it was cool. Like it was just the two of us. There's no distractions. Luckily the weather was kind of crummy. So we weren't tempted to run down to the river every day, and, uh -huh. you know? And so I was chef Boyardee. I was working the, working the kitchen pretty good and he was getting the technical things down. But the nice thing was, was, you know, we'd put in an honest day of work. And then after dinner, if you had an idea, if all of a sudden you go, you know, we should have maybe tried this or tried that. You just run in and see if it works. Whereas if you were at a commercial recording studio you either wouldn't be able to do that because it was booked or closed and also the the clock's ticking and it just costs more money so right i mean obviously in this setting it's easier to do when you've got acoustic instruments and just a couple of guys but uh i mean would you try and record this way again was it uh, satisfying enough that you might try and you know at least do part of, of future recordings this way well, I did one record, and this is a while ago now, it's probably 10 years ago, I did an album called um, Different Views, and Russell Broom actually came out to my place, and we recorded, it was a band record in the house, and that record was a little bit overlooked, it was a lot of fun to do, we had a couple special guests like Sean Barreau from uh, Wide Mouth Mason, and Carolyn Mark sang on a track, and you know, Russell's a, a great producer, and he's now back with Jan Arden, so we did get some airplay and stuff, but I don't know, somehow that record slipped in between the cracks, but for sure, it's something I'd be willing to, to try again. Yeah, well, it sounds like you're, you know, you've worked out most of the kinks, and as you say, it, it presents a lot of advantages, and, and, and clearly you're comfortable with it. To me, it seems like recording at home would be like the worst of all possible scenarios with, you know, having all these people in your house and all that stuff, but yeah, sounds like you're good with it. Well, I live out, you know, it, it's about 15, 20 minutes outside of Nanaimo, but it's family property. And the spot I'm on is 160 acres. It's a Christmas tree farm. Plenty and of room just, for everybody. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of room for, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of room for everyone. There's no noise distractions. Like there's not a train right. going to be going by or cars or honking horns and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's the odd gunshot. <laughs> you know, I live in the I live in the city here, and there's other yacht gunshots. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> but otherwise, it's it's nice. And the big thing is because I have a, I have a big collection of guitars, and hmm. it's nice just to have them all on the wall, you know. And if you go, hey, what I make that twelve string would sound good on this track. 
Mm, yeah, it's true. Everything's at hand, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're not having to load stuff down to a studio and then forget about, you know, you forgot one instrument or you're just too lazy to go back home and get it or something. It's, it's all there, which is, that's another adventure. And also, you know, having my stereo set up. So if we go, hey, this song reminds me of this Muddy Waters record. You run back, grab the vinyl, put it on, have a listen. And that's yeah, just kind of a, a neat way to work. Right. Talking about Muddy, I mean, you've obviously, you've covered Muddy, you've covered Howlin' Wolf on this album, you're, you're doing Dylan again. Um, what, what prompted you to want to dig up that it takes a lot to laugh and put it on the album? I just, I'm just so crazy about Bob Dylan and like that recent thing, I don't know if you saw the, the, um, the black and white thing he did online a couple months mm. ago. Yeah. Oh, I just see, I look at that and I go, there's an 80 year old guy still keeping it fresh and trying new things. And it's just so cool. So he, he's a big inspiration. And that song, um, I, that's one of my favorite songs of his. I love his original recording, but the thing is, if you're going to re record an, a, a cover of Bob Dylan's song, you know that probably 40 other people have covered it. So mm -hmm, that's sure. the good, good thing about Spotify and that is you go back and make sure you're not being too redundant. So I think my second favorite version was the Leon Russell version. And he speeds up the chords a little bit. Like he does a fast four in the verse rather than hanging on the one the whole time. And I think it was... I've got a, another national guitar, but it's a wood body. It's a 35 national Trojan. And I was just kind of playing around with some other tunings and capos when I was getting ready for this album and just kind of hit that groove. And I went, oh, I think I, I, think I'm, I really want to do this song. Hmm. And with Mariner adding the piano and the piano I have in my music room is, a, is an old piano that used to be a player piano, but the guts have been ripped out and they put just standard um, piano guts in it. But it's a little thicker than a, than a usual uh, stand up like an upright piano so it has that old time sound it really kind of ma made the song I, I thought we did a, a cool job of it he plays some great yeah. harmonic on it as well oh it's a good job I mean you, you you always have interesting covers I mean you you tossed everybody from you know Depeche Mode to yeah. you know uh, my favorite Beef Heart I think the first album of yours I heard was was one of the early ones with Beef Heart and my review yeah. was essentially if this guy's covering Beef Heart I'm in you know um, I remember so that, yeah. yeah. How do you how do you choose these covers, and and what's your sort of philosophy when it comes to approaching another artist's work? Well, essentially, I'm a blues artist, and but I don't have you know blinders on at all. I like to listen to a lot of music, but I hear blues in a lot of things, like even that Depeche Mode cover we did, which we got a, you know some pretty good FM commercial FM airplay back in the day when they were allowed to actually play music that they wanted to play. <laughs> yeah, but in in that song, Personal Jesus, I. I heard it as a blues song or as a blues gospel thing and it made sense to cover it and the beef heart thing even though with the funny time signature I mean he's he's a blues guy and totally. so I just yeah I just kind of hear blues like we even covered a Michael Jackson song a couple of records yeah. ago we did um the way you make me feel and I listened to it. I was in a coffee shop I remember despite all the 80s production and the synths and you know drum machines I just heard a blues shuffle and I thought well you know Michael's a guy from Gary Indiana he would have heard the blues when he's young you know and that's what that song is. It's a blue shuffle. So if we, we just, I brought it into the studio and said, forget you ever heard the song. Just pretend it's a, a blues song that's been submitted. Some guy demoed it. And uh, it was fun. Do, do you have like a, a list of, of things that you want to do? Or do they just kind of come up in the moment? You know, you're in the middle of making an album and you hear a song and go, you know what? That actually might fit and, and go from there. I, I do make notes sometimes. Like I'll hear something and I'll, I'll just write it down like a little, you know, note to self. And uh <laughs> Because yeah, you never know when, when something's going to grab you. And then, are you um, are you still writing? I mean, are you already you know thinking in terms of the next album and the one after that and the one after that? Are you that prolific, or is it kind of just project specific? I kind of have to take a, a bit of a breather after yeah. doing an album. That being said, it's funny you bring it up because I was somewhere. I did oh, I did a gig um, a couple of weekends ago in a little place called Cherryville in BC, and I kind of took my time coming home just because it was a beautiful day and I thought, you know, it was summer starting to end. And I started jotting down a couple of things, the same thing. I'd, I'd take a, a, a photo of something or, or, or see an interesting. And so I, I started jotting down notes and I realized that, wow, that's kind of rare for me. Usually once I make a record, it's, it's just like, okay, I'm not even going to think about writing for the next six months. But, um, you know, you can never have enough songs and you never have enough ideas. And, and, and what if next week, you know, I happen to be on the road and run into someone I've always wanted to write with. It's good to have come in with a couple ideas in your pocket. So, do you ever get writer's block? Um, 
Well, at the beginning of my career, I just wasn't interested in writing. You know, the, to me, there was so much really? music to discover. And it wasn't really something that necessarily would float my boat, but now I, I really love doing it. So I think the writer's block was just learning how to write at the beginning of my career. Now, now I enjoy it. And like, even like when, when we were making this record with Mariner, like I, there was a, you know, we realized we needed one more song. And also I said to him just before he came out, I said, I've always, you know, I've written, I've recorded a couple of instrumentals over my career, but I've never written one. So when you get out here, let's write an instrumental. And he's just on all the time. Like he's just going all the time and ideas and everything. And, but, you know, I, I, just, I just feel that I'm better at it. So I don't think I really suffer from block, but I, I tend to, you know, kind of work in spurts. Like, I, like I'll, I'll sit down and write a whole whack of songs and then I won't have anything for a couple of weeks. But it's not necessarily writer's block. It's just, you know, I kind of got those out and, you know, let's kind of build some more up. Well, Elvis Costello told me the same thing when I asked him about being, because he's, you know, kind of perceived as being, insanely prolific and and he said no i don't you know i just when i am productive i am in, insanely productive and i'll write you know a whole whack of songs at once at one clip and then nothing for ages so you're in good company there well that's good that's good to know yeah <laughs> does anybody uh is there one specific person who hears your songs first or is it just you know whoever happens to be in the room no one really hears them, which is funny because I, I, I've worked, uh, you know, kind of on my own a lot lately. There's the one other guy I mentioned earlier, Eric, Eric Johnson. He lives on Gabriola Island, which is, you know, pretty close to me. But, you know, so we'll write the odd thing and, and send it back and forth, just ideas, you know, send it back and forth via email or whatever. But I guess like with this record, once I did a demo, I would send, I've been with the same record company for about 20 years. Cordova Bay Entertainment. So I, I would send a rough demo to Michael Burke, who is the owner, and Jocelyn, who is, um, kind of runs the company now, and just to you know, get a bit of feedback from them. But quite often, I just kind of keep it to myself until it's time to make the record and then uh, you know, present them that way. So yeah, are you somebody who would take these songs on the road and kind of woodshed them typically? or um, I have done that, and that 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 can work because you can realize that oh, geez, you know that that chorus should be half of the length that it that it that it is, you know. But it's difficult for me because I, I do solo shows, and then I have one band out here in the West. I have another band in Ottawa, so it's hard to get the rehearsals happening for something right. like that. Right, it so only works if you're doing a solo acoustic kind of thing, I would guess. Yeah, yeah, I've done that a bit. I've tried out new songs. Um, before I've recorded them when I'm when I'm just doing my solo show. But it's a little more difficult with the band thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You you mentioned having a guitar collection. Are you are you still an active collector? Are you always kind of looking for new stuff? Or uh, have you kind of you know checked all the boxes in terms of, of what you want? There's the old joke that there's always you always there's always one more guitar that you need. Right. And I've got I've got a lot and I started when I was young and so I was fortunate to get a lot of great guitars for super cheap and I see how much some of these guitars or amplifiers are going for now I, I just can't believe it you know <laughs> I'll, I'll see an amplifier that you know when I was a kid you know we'd be buying these old fenders for two, 200 bucks and stuff and now they're 4,000 or something so I mean I like guitars I like going and looking at them I don't necessarily I'm not looking to buy one and that's for sure there's still I still I always wanted Les Paul Jr I've never had that but um it's funny because I think I was at a guitar shop before the pandemic and I forget what it was, but it was a beautiful, beautiful ax. <clears throat> and the guy at the shop takes it. He goes, you want to try it? I went, no, because I knew <laughs> if I tried it, I'd have probably have to buy it. You know? right. yeah. So I, I tend to just be happy with the ones I have right now. But that being said, I've, I've got a whole whack of guitars I mean, and, I've, and I've got, you know, th they're all available and I use them all for recording. Like I'm not one of those guys that just has it behind, a, you know, in a glass case or something. Right. Like when I do my solo shows, I mentioned like I, I fly with the 1930 National and my Gibson somewhere in the late teens, early 20s. Those are the two main guitars I take on tour. And some people have said to me, you know, why don't you get a cheap guitar to tour with? Well, those are my tools and I want to sound as good as I can. And, and, and you know, and that's that's just the way it is, you know, and you can be as careful as, as possible that, you know, hopefully it won't get stolen or destroyed in transit or something. But um Th th those are my axes. I, why would I play, you know, some cheap guitar? <laughs> yeah. Are, are those sort of the prized possessions? Those are the ones that if the house goes up, you're, you're grabbing those and running? Oh, there'd be too many. There's, there's so many <laughs> nice ones. You you're know? going down with the ship, eh? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that you'd have to do that. Yeah. That <laughs> are, are, you, uh, are you a collector when it comes to uh, any other aspects of your career or, or anything else? I mean, do you have 
you know, massive well, collection of other things? I, actually, this is a kind of weird one. I collect antique coal mining lamps, but that's no. because the the, <laughs> pro, the property that we're on, that I'm on, we've lived here, like my family's been here since 1897, which for Vancouver Island for, you know, that's a long time. Long time for anywhere. Yeah, so my dad, like his father and his grandfather and his other grandfather all came from various parts of the world to Vancouver Island to work in the coal mines. Uh, so that kind of piqued my interest when I was younger and I just started collecting them, <laughs> this insane collection of coal mining lamps. <laughs> but the one cool thing that happened during the lockdown was because I was at home so much, I finally went and cleaned out my music room. And this is like 20 years of me coming off the road with a bunch of stuff in a suitcase and throwing it in a box in the corner thinking I'll, I'll sort through that in a week yeah. and it's been 20 years and I started finding the most amazing things because I I'm a bit of a pack rat but I've also you know I make sure like when I, when I open up for someone that I, that I really like I, I've been you know make sure I get a photograph or an autograph or something which wasn't so easy to do 20 30 years ago because we didn't right. have all our cell phones and everything but I started going through this stuff and like I found oh here's in Stevie Ray Vaughan's own handwriting, piece of paper that's got his name, his address, and his phone number that he gave me. Wow. And I went, oh, I should that should be displayed <laughs> somehow. Yeah. So, you know, I was putting together these collages and framing them, you know, so I, like the one with Stevie is a picture of, of me with Stevie, which I was, I was fortunate to get, you know, a picture of one of his guitar picks and then his handwritten address and stuff. And, and just on and on, like finding an Otis Rush autograph or... Henry um, Vestine, the sunflower from Canned Heat. So, you know, I'll just, I, I've been propping them up. You know, John Lee Hooker. So you put a picture in a frame and his autograph. So it's, it's kind of nice as you walk around my house, you get a kind of a, uh, well, uh, there's music, coal mining lamps. And then I just did a big um, Montreal Canadiens wall in my dining room. So I've got a ton of like Guy Lafleur, Jean Beliveau, Rocket Richard stuff. So it seems yeah. to me like all those blues artifacts and all the, you know, all of your musical artifacts could be a coffee table book. Well, I think I'm going to write a book. You know, um, a few people have told me that because as I travel around, and I mentioned, you know, my, my Western band and my Eastern band, I've also got a Dutch band, but I started hiring a couple of fellas um, in, the, in uh, out of Regina a couple of years ago because I was doing some predict, predicts, and it's hard to get, you know, the East or the West. It's, it's made more sense for me to fly in and get some players there. But these are players that are younger than me now. And um, when I start telling those stories about, you know, playing with Albert Collins or, hanging out with Stevie Ray Vaughan or touring with Johnny Winter, they're just, wow, you know, and it's been suggested that I write a book. So I started um, just before the lockdown, I, I started doing a, a podcast, hmm. which has been good for kind of jogging my memory. because I just talk about my experiences with these people. And um, I think we're up to about 36 episodes or something now. So I think I will have to write a book. And because I, I, I have these actual images of me with a lot of these people, it helps out. Totally, yeah. So you've been nominated now for, is it six Junos? Five losses, one disqualification. Disqualification? Why were you, what, what, what did you do? It was the <laughs> silliest thing. Yeah, I always say steroids, but um, <laughs> it was an album that wasn't even supposed to be an album. It was, a, uh, I performed at the Burnaby Blues Festival a number of years ago. And at the time, there was a guy that did a blues radio show on C Fox Radio in Vancouver, a guy, Storm and Norman. And he asked if he could record our set to play on his show and then do a little interview. So we did. And then it started getting shared on the internet. And we thought we were, we were in between projects. And I thought, well, people want to hear this so bad. Why don't we slap a cover on it and put it out? David Gogo Live at Deer Lake. Well, then next thing you know, it, it's getting popular and it's selling. And then it got nominated for a Juno. But the thing is, the criteria was, so we, like, they, they told us, you're nominated. We, we do the press release. We book a gig at the Junos were in Edmonton that year. We did all that stuff that you do. And then they inform us, oh, no, actually, uh, the criteria is you can't have songs you previously recorded to be on a new album that's considered for a Juno. I guess that being so, the Tragically Hip couldn't put out the Tragically Hip's greatest hits or something. and, and right. be up for, you know. But we said, well, there's only four out of the eight songs that we've recorded before and they're brand new recordings are live but there's yeah. no way they're going to let us out of it and they said no rules are rules and that's just the way it is okay and then they turn around and for album of the year just general album of the year at the junos the criteria for that is it's, they just go by sales strictly by sales yeah. so they had the, the five nominees but then nickelback's management looks and goes we've sold more records than all these guys put together and we're not yeah. nominated so they get a hold of karis or whoever and they go, oh, oops, you know. So they added them. 
after yeah. telling us there's no way they can make a change. So anyways, what we did was we just did a spin doctor thing and uh, told everyone the plight. And my, my son was five or six years old at the time. And, uh, you know, oh, you know, my, my mom had made him a little tuxedo to go to the awards. And now it's, you know, so we, we got way more publicity out of being nom- or uh, disqualified than I ever would have got, even if I'd won, because the blues category isn't televised. It's the, it's the night before there's the big gala dinner and that's when all the jazz, blues, technical, classical, you name it. You know, the, t- the television show is the same eight categories, same eight people every year. Um, but it was hilarious. I mean, we got coverage in Billboard magazine, um, great big banner plus a half page in, in, in the, the National Post, uh, you know, uh, um, Peter Mansbridge and Juno Gaff and all this stuff. And, when, <laughs> and, we, and we still went to the awards. We still went there. So I still drank the champagne. And, you know, it was so funny to, to see like Vicky Gabbro or someone go, oh, man, that was such a great, you know, bare naked ladies. Man, you really got the shaft. And but the, 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 the one thing was I, I did one record with EMI records. It was Capital, when I signed it was Capital, but then they turned to EMI Music Canada. And I turned around and all of a sudden I was face to face with the late Dean Cameron, who had been the head of EMI for a long time and now was the head of Keras. And he just looks at me and he goes, nice publicity, David. <laughs> and I said, thank you, Dean. And I thought, well, that's the last time I'll ever be nominated for Juno. But they keep nominating me. And I think that's their little cat and mouse games. They nominate me and then I lose again and they just make me feel bad. They want you to be the <laughs> Erica Kane of the Junos. Oh, man. It, and, and, you know, like it's, it's almost silly at this point, but you know, I know where all the good parties are. And <laughs> yeah, and you got you got all you got enough collections of stuff already. Who needs a Juno in that mess? It would take up the, the space that I could use for a good old safety lamp from the mine. Exactly, sir. <laughs> so listen, have we talked about uh, everything you wanted to get to, or is there something else that we should be discussing? I think we're good. I mean, I'm I'm really pleased with the new with the new album. Um, you know, the people who have heard it, 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 it's, you know, not even officially released now for till a couple of weeks from now, but the people who have heard it, especially people in the industry have known for a long time um, that I respect, uh, are, you know, it's been real like double thumbs up. So that's cool. And I'm just hoping that, you know, like Mariner and I are doing a short Western Canadian tour coming up, you know, if the good Lord's willing and the Creek don't rise and the COVID <laughs> doesn't explode again. And uh, so that's fun. And that's something new. We've only done a couple shows together in the past and, and it's a lot of spontaneity and, and um, so I'm looking forward to that but otherwise you know just keep on keeping on as they say 